Okay, well, let's begin, okay? So tonight we're talking about inner healing, okay? And uh, inner healing is one of those terms that you hear, and sometimes you ask, what is inner healing, okay? And it, it actually is kind of broad, and uh, it's not as easy to define, I think, as, as physical healing, as deliverance, um, because it's, it's pretty broad, or it, it, and it has a lot that's contained in it. But to kind of introduce it, I want to read um, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So, salvation, you know, salvation brings us out of darkness and into light, okay? It brings us out of the kingdom or the domain of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of God. Now, um, even though that's in a, an immediate thing, a lot of times there are areas in our heart that still need work. Would you all agree with that? Right? We all have areas in our heart that need a little bit of work, a little bit of sanctification. And we can all be, you know, very emotionally healthy, but we may have some areas where we just need God to work on those things. And um, one thing about this that, you know, and we'll look into this as we go, but th this talks about captives, it talks about prisoners. And a lot of times issues of the heart can really keep us captive, right? Uh, unforgiveness can actually put us in prison. And we're, we're going to look at some scriptures that deal with that. And uh, we're going to look at things that, um, just kind of as an introduction, things that keep us, keep us captive, okay? And the thing is, Jesus wants us free. He's come to set us free in every area of our life. And, you know, even as believers, we can become captives to certain things. We can become captive to sin, even when we're born again. We can become captive to things like emotional wounding, okay? And we can become captive to false belief systems. And those don't necessarily have to be uh, like false doctrines or things like that, but often they are false belief systems that we may have about ourselves. And so, uh, you know, or we, we can become captive by patterns of immorality, which often come because we're bound in, uh, in false belief systems. And so uh, inner healing is really the process of setting our hearts free and setting us free in areas of our life to come into freedom and fullness. Um, one, one definition of inner healing is, is that it is a ministry that provides freedom through a process of sanctification that every believer needs over the course of a lifetime, okay? Um, sanctification is ongoing, right? We're continually going through a process of being sanctified. We're continually going through a process of being set free. Um, inner healing often goes through stages in our life. I mean, um, if I'm being honest, uh, I had an inner healing session last week that I sat with Dwayne and um, I was aware of some issues that were surfacing in my life. And, um, you know, just because I'm a leader and just because I'm teaching on these things, that doesn't mean that I don't have areas that I need inner healing in, okay? And I had some woundedness that surfaced. Isn't it interesting when you start teaching about inner healing, what happens? You start, your junk starts surfacing the, the the stuff that you 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 think you've dealt with and sometimes you push it down and you think you're good but then that some of that starts surfacing and so I knew that I needed some inner healing and I, I know that that's something that we need through the course of our life we always need those things and so I knew also through the teaching and and going into finishing up inner healing teaching this month and going into deliverance um, part, you know Jesus said that we we freely receive and we freely give. And so um, I, I always need more. If I'm going to give out, I know that I need more. So I think, you know, the thing is, no matter where we are in our lives, whether we're newly saved, newly born again, or we've been born again most of our lives, 
we're always in process and God is always working to sanctify us and he's always working to bring in inner healing, okay? So um, before I talk a lot more about inner healing though, I do wanna talk about the relationship between inner healing and deliverance. And um, some people uh, seem to gravitate more when they minister to inner healing. Others gravitate more towards deliverance and how they minister. And really, the truth is you really need both of them, okay? Some people use the example of uh, inner healing is the hand and deliverance is the glove and, um, or vice versa. And I think that's really true because, um, you know, uh, when, when you're, you know, when, when you're in the process of, say, for example, doing deliverance and you know that there's demonic oppression in someone's life, um, just casting out a demon without doing inner healing uh, often is a short-term approach that won't bring lasting freedom, okay? And, uh, you know, many of us know Rodney Hoag, and I, I really appreciate uh, Rodney Hoag's example of trash and flies. And uh, some of you have heard me talk about that. But, you know, if you have um, a pile of trash, it's going to draw flies. And um, you can swat flies, you can try to get rid of flies. Um, same way with mice and vermin and all that. Trash draws those things. But if you will eliminate the trash, if you'll eliminate the garbage, those flies, those vermin will leave. And often uh, when, you're, when you want to get to the root of something, you have to discover what, what has opened up the door. Um, what is there woundedness that has caused something to come in, something demonic? Is there unforgiveness that has opened a door? Um, it, it, are there vows? Are there some of those things? And we'll try to cover some of these in brief tonight. But, you know, deliverance ministry really isn't entirely effective without inner healing. And even inner healing itself can be a real key for physical healing. Um, I, I know, you know, you got, some of you guys know about years ago how uh, my wife Jamie uh, had some real serious physical problems. She spent about a year in bed, unable to get out of bed. Our children were small. My daughter Emily, who's 20 now, was a baby, and um, Jamie was just really ill, and uh, many people prayed for her. Um, you know, it was one of those things when, when I would pray for her, and uh, her pain would increase or it would move, and she would tell me, stop praying for me. Well, she had a spirit of infirmity, and we didn't know that. We didn't understand that, and, you know, many people would pray for her. You know, and uh, but she would never improve, and sometimes she would actually get worse. And she did did get a bit of a measure of of healing, just doing some nutritional things, uh, to the point that we were able to go to Japan as missionaries. But uh, while we were there, um, you know, some of those things begin to emerge, and she actually went through an inner healing and deliverance session uh, with a lady named Teddy Saka. Um, who was a missionary out of Tokyo, and she and her husband are apostolic leaders in the nation of Japan, and uh, they identified doors that had been open in Jamie's life and some vows and some judgments that she had made that allowed a spirit of infirmity and a spirit of death to come in and cause her to be ill. And when, um, when Jamie, and sometimes maybe, and some of you may have heard her testimony, and maybe you'll have an opportunity to hear that again. But when she repented and, and when she turned over some situations to Jesus, um, she was healed. And those things left. And um, I think if uh, just prayer, obviously just prayers of physical healing weren't enough. Um, also, just if we had just rebuked um, a spirit of death or a spirit of infirmity, I think because of some judgments and some open doors, that would have come back. And so inner healing is so key. And it's really hard to separate oftentimes inner healing, physical healing, and deliverance. They really all are tied together. And, and for Jamie, for her, for that particular healing, it really was inner healing that was the key. And um, I don't think she would mind me sharing that. She shared that publicly. Uh, so. Uh, let's talk about inner healing and let's define it and look at some of the core things in it. And uh, I, I really like this definition from John Lauren Sanford. 
and I've given it to you guys in your notes, okay? So it's, it's a little long. It's not just a dictionary definition, but inner healing is actually the application of the crucified and resurrected life of Jesus Christ and His blood to those parts of my heart and yours that did not fully get the message when we first received Jesus as Savior. Because some areas deep in our hearts have not believed and accepted the good news of our death and rebirth in Him, the fullness of His work has not yet happened for us. We are new creatures in Christ, but some of our old, self-centered, selfish character continues to act in its ugly old ways as though we had not yet fully received the Lord. Inner healing then is evangelism to unbelieving hearts of believers. Amen. I mean, how many of you know, how many of you know that you have areas in your life that aren't yet quite sanctified? If you're not sure, ask your husband or your wife or your kids, all right? And they'll tell you, well, maybe they won't tell you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there are certain areas that still need to be sanctified. They still need to be brought to maturity. And so, um, you know, inner healing is a form of discipleship for it's transforming a believer into the image of Christ, okay? And we really, really, really need discipleship in the body of Christ, right? It's so important uh, because it, it actually brings transformation and inner healing and deliverance as well. Those are very, very important things to bring discipleship and maturity into our lives. So the author of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Now, when you read this, you know, he, obviously Paul is talking to believers. He's talking, he calls these people his brothers and sisters, and he warns them not to cause their unbelieving hearts to make them uh, turn away from God. Now, I don't think that this has to do with, you know, um, denying our faith or denying Christianity or anything like that. But sometimes if we, there are areas where we, we're wounded or we have issues, our, our heart will not believe what God has said. Have you ever struggled sometimes in believing what God has promised? I think we can all say yes, right? There are moments when we may doubt the goodness of God. We may doubt the promises of God. We may doubt um, our salvation even. We may doubt that we can live in peace or joy or all those things. And so inner healing is the process of awakening the heart and moving it towards a full realization of everything that has been freely given to us through Jesus' redemptive work, right? I heard a story once about a lady. Um, she was a... Everybody, you know, she was like this almost homeless woman out on the streets and, uh, you know, carried around her plastic bags with what everybody thought were her belongings. And um, she passed away. Uh, and I, I believe this story comes from Nikki Gumbel, who's the uh, guy who developed Alpha Course. And Nikki was called, um, uh, he's a minister in the Church of England, uh, called to uh, do the funeral. And no one was there. But they found out upon her death, and she did have this small apartment, um, that she was actually quite wealthy. And, um, but she lived as though she had no wealth. Okay, And, uh, you know, I think we're like that sometimes as believers, either because we don't know the Word, or we know the Word, but because of um, maybe some false beliefs, some woundedness, some judgments, we don't realize what belongs to us, and we live like we don't have all that. You know, uh, it's like if you traveled, or you went on a cruise. Anybody here ever been on a cruise? You know, and you went on a cruise, and all your food is already purchased, and you don't know that, and so you pack peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to keep in your room the whole week, right? When you could have been dining at the captain's table. Okay. Inner healing takes us out of it, takes us into that reality of this is what you have, you can live in it. Okay, and so you know it, it has to do with, with God awakening our hearts. 
Uh, another thing that we can look at about inner healing is from uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay, and you have that in your notes. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? These basic foundational things from, you know, if you were a good evangelical like me, you grow up knowing these things. You get people saved through these things, and I believe that. It goes on to say, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, the reality is that these verses emphasize that it is not with the mind that salvation is experienced, okay? But the emphasis is on a believing heart, okay? And, you know, I think we do have a problem in much of the American church that um, a lot of times people mentally agree with the gospel, okay? Uh, but maybe their lives don't reflect it, or uh, we, we may be believing, we may be like, oh God, I agree this is true, but in, in the innermost parts of our hearts, we may not agree with that, okay? And um, so righteousness comes when one's heart comes into full agreement with our confessions. So inner healing is the sanctifying work of converting a person's character into that of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's awakening the heart. It's bringing us into the reality of what God has said, okay? Now, let's talk about some of the issues that often keep us bound, okay? And again, I'm just, you know, because I'm, I'm, look, this is an overview. This is like an introduction. And, but, uh, so there are some of these issues we could go and these things we could go into much deeper on. But this is just basically some introduction. Now, one of the, the, the greatest things that you'll, you'll get into in inner healing and also deliverance is the need for forgiveness, okay? Forgiveness is so, so important. And, um, you know, uh, in the model prayer, in Jesus, when he taught his disciples his prayer, he emphasized the practice of forgiveness when he commanded his followers to pray and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors, Okay. He taught them to pray in this way. He's covering every part of life. And I think even in one of the Gospels, when he finishes talking about the Lord's Prayer, and I can't remember which one it is, he, he then re-emphasizes the need for forgiveness, that we're to forgive. Okay, And uh, um, so we're releasing other people's indebtedness to us. And Dr. Rodney Hoag, he himself, uh, he has a great book on forgiveness. And he wrote, this is the essence of forgiveness, releasing the other person's indebtedness to you, okay? And uh, so, you know, a, a very familiar passage of Scripture, and, uh, but it's in Matthew 18, and I don't think this is in your notes because it was such a long passage of Scripture, but uh, let's turn there in Matthew 18, 21. And uh, we won't read through all of it for the sake of time, but this is the story of, uh, the servant who had a debt dismissed, but then he would go out and uh, he, he began to uh, <laughs> beat and demand money from uh, those who, who owed him. And uh, his, his master, who'd forgiven him of all this, he finds out about it. And it's, let's, let's just start reading in verse 32. Uh, it says, Then summoning him, and this is Matthew 18, 32, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And so shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart, okay? So that's a pretty serious verse. You know, it highlights the traumatic effect of not giving others and not forgiving them from the heart, okay? So, um, you know, and really, who really suffers from unforgiveness? We do. I mean, if I am so angry at Ariel, you know, and I, I'm just, I just can't forgive her, and I'm tormented, 
by what she did to me or what she said about me. Um, and she may not have a clue. She's just going through life and she's happy and, you know, she loves driving between Ada and Stratford and Ardmore and Stratford. She loves that. And so her life is so content and, and I'm the one who's suffering, right? And I'm the one who, because, and we'll get into this in a minute, it, it, you know, you reap what you sow. And if you um, sow unforgiveness, you're going to reap unforgiveness. You're going to reap, reap, reap torment. You're going to reap those things. And so, um, and, uh, you know, um, unforgiveness, you know, actually gives the enemy access, and these verses show that, to have a tormenting influence in someone's life if he chooses or if he or she chooses not to forgive no matter how justified he may feel right and this uh this forgiveness it cannot simply be a mental agreement that forgiveness should be given right jesus actually emphasizes in verse 35 that um that if will be turned over to the tormentors if we don't forgive our brother from the heart. Okay. So now I think, do you begin in faith? Right? Have you ever forgiven anybody in faith? And you, your, your emotions were not there. And you start off with, God, I forgive them. Right? And, and sometimes the inner healing process <laughs> is getting to the point where your heart starts releasing that. Okay? And, and, and we're going to look in just a few minutes. Sometimes a, a part of the, that inner healing process is you start changing the way you think. Okay? If you want to forgive people, you start meditating on what the Word says about the mercy of God. Right? You start med meditating about things like what Jesus did on the cross. You know, I have, uh, you know, many of you know, have heard me talk about Dr. Sam Matthews. And Dr. Matthews' wife, um, Kathy, uh, in, in the late, in like late 80s, went through a very serious time where she almost died. And they were believing God. And, um, and, and, you know, they were in an intense intercession and that whole time. I won't, the story's so beyond me being able to tell now. But in the process um, where they were in this intense time of warfare and believing and trauma in her body, um, she saw the cross. And she saw, she was taken to Calvary and she saw what Jesus did and, and, and um, was, was there in the Spirit. And uh, um, she basically said, Lord, I will not complain again and I'll walk through this, right? Because she saw the mercy of God and, and she came out of that. She was healed. Um, many, many other things happened through their prayers and what they walked through. But if we really see the mercy of God and how much mercy we've received, um, we'll, it'll be much easier to extend forgiveness. So, you know, forgiveness is so key to staying free, and it's so key to being healed, okay? So here's a great quote from Rodney Hogue and, uh, from his book on forgiveness, and, and I love this so much. It's so powerful, and I, I think you have it in your notes. It says, The unseen world is altered whenever we do something that is in agreement with heaven, okay? You want to see things altered in your life? in your city, your church, your community, your nation. Well, agree with heaven. And here, here's, here are some of the things that happen. Um, for, back to Rodney's quote. Sorry, I got off track there. Angels are activated, demons become bound, and there is a shift in the atmosphere that is not always seen by the naked eye. Jesus said that, when, that we are given keys that bind and loose so that the gates of hell will not prevail. Our activities will release what has been bound and will bind what needs to be released. Nothing seems to do that more than forgiveness. Healing is released in the body. Division among people becomes mended and heaven's favor is restored. Right? 
So who wants, who wants to see healing released in people's bodies, in, their, in your own body, right? Who wants to see um, division among people get mended? Good grief, if even, even division in the church in this city got mended, can you imagine how it would shift the city? You know, our crime rate is really high, and yet we have churches literally on every corner. Uh, I know that at one point when we did uh, the burn years ago, which was a 24-7 uh, prayer and worship movement, um, I sent out flyers to every church in Carter County that I could find in some of the surrounding counties and postcards for when we started that. And I sent out, I think, 120 postcards to churches. And that's how many churches there are. And I think three were involved in the burn. Um, <laughs> But just think of forgiveness, if that, if that was produced in the body of Christ, what that would do. If we would see heaven's favor restored when we walk in forgiveness. So forgiveness is so key to inner healing and for deliverance as well. And we'll talk about that in the future when we talk about um, deliverance. So some of the benefits of forgiveness. We are free to move on from bitterness and pain. Amen. Who likes bitterness and pain in their life? I don't. You know, I want to be free from that. Um, if we stay in unforgiveness, it can actually do things like um, delay or hinder or completely halt God's purposes in our life. Okay? Think of Joseph in the Bible. I mean, Joseph had every reason, uh, not Mary and Joseph, but Joseph in the book of Genesis, right? Uh, if my brothers um, were initially going to kill me, that's pretty good grounds for unforgiveness. But then they, you know, one brother argues, and so they just sell Joseph into slavery. Um, he goes uh, into slavery. He's working for Potiphar in his house. Um, he gets accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. He goes into prison. You know, if, if Joseph had... A right to be bitter. If anyone had that right, Joseph did. So when his brothers that put him in this position, when he eventually becomes to be Pharaoh's right-hand man and ruling over the entire nation of Egypt uh, under Pharaoh, his brothers show up, how many of us would be tempted to be like, dude, it's my moment, right? I I've, can so uh, get back at these guys. But because he had walked through a process um, in prison, in the dungeon, all those things. He'd walked in forgiveness. It actually, I believe if he had stayed in unforgiveness, he couldn't have come into God's ultimate purposes for him. Um, what if, and think, even if he didn't come in to forgiveness and his brothers show up and he wipes them out, what happens to the Jews? The entire Jewish nation basically... And there were some still back in Israel, in the prom, you know, in Canaan, but they're wiped out. God's plan to bring a Messiah into the earth doesn't happen if he stays in bitterness and unforgiveness. So, you know, unforgiveness, we would probably be shocked, and we'll, maybe we'll be shocked, I don't know how to work in heaven, if we'll know opportunities that were missed because of unforgiveness revivals and moves of God that were missed because of unforgiveness or shut down because of unforgiveness. Uh, you know, unforgiveness is so key to releasing us into our destiny, okay? Um, some of you guys have heard me give this one testimony uh, from the nation of Japan. It's one of the scariest things I've ever seen. Um, you know, when we were there and uh, a lot of times we would do deliverance with, um, because we were part of an international church, and there were, in addition to many Japanese people, there were also foreigners and English speakers, and so uh, we would often do deliverance with the foreigners. And so we had an American lady who was married to a Japanese man. Uh, she came um, for, for deliverance, and we're ministering to her, and a few, maybe 20, 30, 40 minutes into the session, she suddenly falls on the floor and slithers across the floor like a snake. And I thought, oh, this could be a demon. And um, it, was, it was scary. And so, 
you know, we start talking to her and we're, we're, we're trying to find what open door does she have. And, um, you know, of course we find out that her first husband, not the man she was presently married to, uh, but her first husband had killed their child who was about four years old. And she said, I refuse to forgive him. And that's a hard one, okay? But it caused such bitterness in her life. Um, you know, we, we had to shut the session down because she just refused. Um, she almost split the church. Uh, she ended up leaving. Um, a few years after that, you know, keeping up with her on Facebook, uh, she's divorced uh, the, the, her second husband. Um, she's living in America now. Um, I, I literally had to uh, not block her, but hide her on Facebook because of all the bitterness in her comments. And so, um, you know, ultimately as painful as those circumstances were, it's the fruit of unforgiveness has kept her bound in devastation. It's kept her in bitterness and it's kept her in a cycle that she's having a hard time breaking out of. So, all right, so we know that unforgiveness is so key in walking in forgiveness. Now, let's talk um, for just a few moments about um, four spiritual laws from Elijah House. And Elijah House is the ministry that um, John, John Lauren Sanford and uh, or his wife, that as they minister to people in inner healing, when it came to relationships, these are four keys that kept coming up over and over again, okay? And so if you're, and, and I pray that as you come out of this class, um, not only will, uh, you know, you find freedom in your own life, but the whole goal of this is not just knowledge, but that it's equipping for you guys to be ministers of inner healing, okay? And that as you, uh, as you mentor or disciple or are on teams to bring this, that you can bring people into freedom. Amen. And so these are just some four common issues uh, that, that they kept running into. And so here, here they are. And they'll often, um, in each one of those, they're just laws for relationships. Okay. Um, you want to have a good marriage. You want to have good relationships with children and all those things and others. These are really laws of relationships that if, if you'll walk in these um, and, and you'll walk in freedom and health. So uh, the first one, and again, if you, if, you, if, you, if you miss it on the first one, it'll often lead to a, a downward spiral with the others, okay? So the first one is the law of honoring parents, okay? And Deuteronomy 5.16, says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Okay. So God gives a promise. Okay. And a lot of times you'll find that when, uh, when God put a spiritual law in effect, it was actually so that it would produce blessing. Okay. And, uh, um, unfortunately, <laughs> um, what often happens is if we don't obey the law because what God intended to be blessing, if we don't follow it or if we break it, it actually will cause a curse to come, okay? So if we honor our parents, okay, what's the promise? That God gives us life. He gives us blessing, and uh, here's something else that John Lauren Sanford wrote. To honor means to obey and to try to respect. It means to love and cherish and forgive. Some parents are not honorable, but God calls us to try from the heart. Okay. And again, as with anything, there are boundaries to that. Okay. You know, if, if your parents were dysfunctional um, and they brought destruction to your life, you know, maybe there, there were boundaries that were put in um, to protect you, you know, and it's, it's hard to honor a parent in that situation. But still, even in those moments, even as children, even now as adults, we have to learn to forgive what was done. Amen. So 
A lack of honoring parents will remove blessing and cause confusion to enter. Okay, and and so we want to honor, we want to bless. Um, and again, you know, sometimes as kids, uh, you know, we judge parents because we don't always understand what was really going on. Okay, sometimes in our lack of understanding, and you know, the example of, you know, a, a parent. Maybe a father wasn't there very much because he was working two jobs to provide for his kids. Well, the kids don't always understand that, and they're like, you know, my father wasn't there for me, okay? We see things often through our filter, okay? And even our filters, though they may not be true, they're true to us, and we can release judgment, okay? Now, that's what, that brings us to the second law, which is the, the law or the principle of, of judging, okay? Matthew 7, 1 and 2 states, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, okay? Now, this isn't talking about, you know, obviously from Scripture and things like that. We, we judge certain things. We judge, oh, this is sin, this is wrong. But when, when we're judging others, especially parents, with impure hearts filled with blame, with anger, with envy, with jealousy. Um, God's law is activated, okay? And it won't go well with us when we judge, okay? And, you know, um, there's the, the judgment of... Now, sometimes it is healthy when we determine, okay, maybe you grew up in a dysfunctional family and you determine, you know what? I'm not going to be an alcoholic because I don't want to see my fam my children destroyed. But when, when there's bitterness, when there's judgment, uh, when there's unforgiveness towards parents because of that, it actually activates that law of judgment. Okay, And we all know that um, Jesus looks at the heart, right? Um, he, he looks at the motives of our heart. And so... Um, and again, he wants to bring us into freedom and forgiveness, okay? But there is this law of judging. That leads us to the principle of sowing and reaping. Again, this is a law that God really intended to be a blessing, right? Did, doesn't God, God want us to be blessed by what we sow and what we reap, right? And, you know, there's a principle. We always reap more than we sow, and that should be a good thing, shouldn't it? Right? I mean, if you plant a garden and you plant a few seeds and you tend everything correctly and it blooms and blossoms, doesn't it produce a lot more than what you planted? Right? And, and then you can take even what you, you grew and you can partake of it and you can save seeds and you can just keep growing and you can keep, har keep harvesting. I mean, God meant that to be a blessing, but... You know, what happens when we start um, sowing <laughs> unforgiveness? What happens when we start sowing judgment? What starts happening when we sow jealousy? Uh, what starts happening in all those situations? You know, because there's a universal law, you know, we'll reap what we sow. And uh, Galatians 6, 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to their flesh... From the flesh shall reap destruction, and whoever sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit shall reap eternal life. Okay? So often, you know, when we make these judgments, it produces wounds in our life. That's why it's so important when we walk in forgiveness, because these wounds actually get healed through forgiveness and repentance. Okay? Right? Because what happens is when we judge... What happens? Judgment comes back to us. Okay. Uh, another quote from John Lauren Sanford. He wrote, At the right time, therefore, God sent the Lord Jesus, who went to the cross, to bear the results of all our sinning. His mercy awaits one thing, our seeing and confessing the sin that planted the seed we are now reaping or will reap. Okay. So if you, wanna, if you want to stop the cycle of reaping, where do you start? You stop sowing, right, and, and you forgive and you repent, okay? 
And um, repentance is also extremely important. Um, here's another quote. This is a great quote from Jack Frost. Okay, And he says, What is required of you for healing? To give your father a gift he may not deserve. Forgiveness. Or it may be your mother, or a grandparent, or a teacher, or a boss, or a sibling. Okay? Uh, be willing to forgive your earthly father for each area in his life where he failed to represent Father God's love. Okay? If you do not forgive, then you may end up carrying the baggage of father issues around for much of your life. You may end up getting your identity from the pain and disappointments of your early father's house. Healing begins when you begin to forgive, take personal responsibility for present relational issues, and do not seek to blame others for them. Right? And we all understand, you know, we, we've all had things wound us in our life and that most of them we probably weren't responsible for. Yet, there comes a moment when you take responsibility by walking in forgiveness. Okay? Maybe you weren't responsible for what happened to you, but you can be responsible for what you do with it through forgiveness. You know? And you, know, you can even apply this if you had an absentee father or if you had an absentee mother, right? And there's woundedness because of that. You, know, you can still forgive. Right? It's probably very healthy to do that. Okay? So if we continue this process of, of judging and um, sowing and reaping, and then finally, you know, it takes us to this, this last, this final law, the fourth one, the law of becoming what one judges in another. Okay? Often what we hold before us is often what we become like. Okay? Uh, Romans 2 Chapter 1 says, uh, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Right? We all know the example of um, you know, most people who abuse their kids um, were abused themselves. And um, they, they made a vow. Oh, I am not going to do this to my kids, right? And if, if they don't break that vow, if they don't forgive, if they don't let some of those things go, they often end up doing the same thing, okay? And part of that is because, you know, it's a learned behavior um, that becomes our normal, okay? You know, I knew a guy who uh, married someone who was a little bit mentally off, but his mom was a little bit mentally off. Isn't that strange? You know, and, and what was his normal in childhood became his normal in his adult life. Um, but, you know, we often, we, we become what we judge in other people. Another Sanford quote, The law of increase ensures that not only will we remain like those we judge, we will become more and more like them. I have found it to be a good law that whoever judges another dooms himself to do the same thing or something stemming from the same root. When one judges others, he often becomes the very thing which he hates. Okay. So what's the key? The key is forgiveness. Okay. The key is repentance for hope for those judgment. It's letting those things go. Now, Again, what, what else? There's another step. And often in dealing with these things, we can forgive, we can repent. Um, but, you know, and we've talked in days past about strongholds and how uh, certain things get built in our thinking and our emotions and our behavior. And so um, we have to really, what, what we focus on reproduces what we think about. Okay? Um, a focus on sin will produce sinful behavior, while focusing on Jesus and His righteousness will produce His purpose and destiny in one's life. Amen. Now, I don't think we should, we should never evaluate things, okay? Um, the Holy Spirit will want to convict us, right? He'll lead us into righteousness and those things. But often we need to start thinking about who Jesus is, what He's done, 
um, in order to start shifting our thinking, okay? And um, so even though repentance is extremely important, believers must not only turn from sin, they must change the way they think about themselves, right? That's why this month I'm having you do an identity statement, okay? Because we need to shift. We need to start thinking. We need to start meditating on what God says, on what Scripture says, because it's, it's actually forming a good stronghold, right? Because if we just dismantle something that's negative, you just have a void, right? And, and what we need is to create a healthy way of thinking, a healthy stronghold, okay? Um, repentance and forgiveness is not enough. Being conformed to the image and character of Jesus and thinking His thoughts is the goal, right? Here's a quote from Chris Vallotton. The Bible says we were created in God's image. In other words, what God imagined we became. Proverbs says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's from Proverbs 23, 7. Our imagination is a very powerful part of our being. Everything that has ever been built, made, painted, or developed begin in someone's imagination, and we tend to reproduce, reproduce what we feast upon. Okay? So if you start meditating on what God says about you, okay, and here's where we often run into it. We expect like 10 minutes after we start meditating that everything's going to change. Does anybody do that? We live, you know, we live in a fast food generation. We live in a microwave generation. And so we're like, well, you know, it's just like when anybody ever start a diet and a day in, you're like, I have seen no change. Right? Well, you didn't get fat overnight. All right? <laughs> It was a process. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like it. You're, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't get in these pants. No, it's been slowly coming, right? But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same way. You know, it takes time, right? And strongholds didn't get built overnight, you know, they, and they're dismantled through our consistent effort. Now, God gives grace to help us. That's the good thing, right? He, he and as we sow those things, in our lives and as we meditate on what he says, as we feast on who he says that we are, it brings change. Okay. So now, what about your role as a prayer minister? Okay. What, you know, if, you're, if you feel called to do some of these things, here's some principles that we're giving you. We'll give you other principles. But as a prayer minister, part of your prayer assignment is to create an atmosphere and culture of unconditional love that transforms people as they step out of sin, unforgiveness, and judgment. Okay? Now, um, I'll be honest, sometimes it's easier to create a, um, a culture of unconditional love than others. <laughs> Some people are, are more lovable than others. Okay, but part of your job as a prayer minister is, is you, can, you create that atmosphere when you meet with people, when you pray with people, that you love them. Amen? And, uh, you know, as, a, as an inner healing minister, you have to constantly point people towards Jesus and His love, point people towards Scripture, point, point people to those things. Bob Sorge uh, wrote, you, can't, you won't get healed of rejection by analyzing the source of your rejection, but by looking at your source of acceptance. Okay, Anybody here ever experienced rejection? We all have. It's part of life. So what happens if you just keep thinking about that and staying on that? You'll never move past it. right? So we don't analyze those things, but what we look is we turn our eyes toward Jesus. right? We, we put our eyes on Him. We worship Him. Okay. We, we, we put our imagination, we put our hearts on Him, and that actually will bring healing in our life. Um, another Sanford quote about the, the prayer minister. The toughest work of inner healing is to give unconditional love again and again until the other does become good soil. In another sense, it is not tough at all 
since it is Jesus alone who can love people to life while we have the joy of participating. Okay. One of the, one of the best things about an inner healing session and a deliverance session is, and it, it's frustrating, but it's wonderful because if you're involved in this ministry, you're simply a facilitator, right? Even though you're obviously there to help people, you're there, you're help to guide them into maybe blind spots that they have or areas where they're not free, but ultimately you're facilitating people into moving into an encounter with God, right? And that's what really sets people free. You know, I know Dwayne's made this statement. I know um, when I've done some deliverance sessions, my favorite part is when God just shows up. You know, and you, you maybe, yeah, you're key in leading people into that. But when He shows up and when people encounter Him, um, you just get to say, oh, isn't this awesome? Right? Oh, they're just encountering the Lord. Now, again, you had a key role in that. But that's when you really know that what your, your goal and your aim was for in that session has been produced. Okay? You're facilitating encounters. Okay? And um, so we get the joy of participating in that. It's almost like you're a midwife. Right? You're helping the process come along, go along. Right? Um, now... I like this as well. The role of the prayer minister can perhaps be best described by Paul in the book of Romans. He wrote, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Amen. So you're leading people in into this. You're leading them into... Um, you know, as a prayer minister, you're getting freedom, but so also that you can produce and bring others into that freedom. Amen? So you will facilitate those things. Now, I want to take just a few minutes and I want to do an activation, okay? So I know you guys have an evaluation form, and just write on the back of the evaluation form, okay? And here's what we're going to do, okay? We're going to take a couple of minutes and you're going to ask the Lord a question and he's going to speak to you. Okay? Don't worry, you're not going to have to stand up and read these or I'm not going to make you prophesy to anybody. Okay? Here's what I want you to ask the Lord. Okay? When you ask the question, just get quiet, listen, and start writing down what you hear. Okay? So, I want you to ask the Lord, Jesus, what do you think about me? What do you think about me? Okay? And don't overthink it. Start writing what he says to you. <laughs> 